Yes, we'll go ahead and get started. We have a new feature tonight. Um, it's a prophetic update. So I'm going to give you an update on some prophetic things. Uh, as we jump into that, let's start with this. So let's look at the dispensational chart, and I want to remind us of the following. There is a current obsession, a current fascination with looking for the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy during the dispensation of grace. And so people look at the goings-on in the Middle East, and they <coughs> view those events as somehow the fulfillment of something in the Old Testament, whether it's a, something in Ezekiel, Daniel, or, or otherwise. But there's, they, they, they look at current events, and they see those as the fulfillment of prophecy. Now, if you think about the chart just for a minute, if we look at the chart with the dispensation of grace and without the dispensation of grace, it is very evident that what the dispensation of grace does is it interrupts the prophetic timeline. It prevents prophecy from being fulfilled because it puts it on hold. <clears throat> Inasmuch as it puts it on hold, there is no prophecy fulfilled during the dispensation of grace. We've talked about that at length previously, so I won't mention that further now. <clears throat> but let's now go to the next subject, and that is this. Is the, the rapture imminent? People frequently speak of the rapture being imminent, and they've done this for a long time. <clears throat> and they say that it is because they say that there are no prophecies, there's nothing that has to be fulfilled before the rapture occurs, so the rapture can occur at any time. Now think about this. I'm going to tell you the rapture is not imminent. Look with me at 1 Timothy chapter 4 and 2 Timothy chapter 3. In other words, the word imminent means it can happen at any time. Look with me at 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now when Paul wrote that in 1 Timothy 4, could the rapture have happened the next day? And the answer, if you think about it, is no. Because 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 is a prophecy. It's Paul saying that in the latter times, which is future, some certain things have to occur apart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now compare 1 Timothy 4 with 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. So 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 talks about latter times. 2 Timothy 3 verse 1 talks about last days. Latter times comes before last. Times is often used for years. Days is shorter than years. So latter times is getting near the end of the dispensation of grace. Last days is the very end of the dispensation of grace. So is the rapture imminent during all times of the dispensation of grace? And the answer has to be no, because you first have to have the latter times occur and then you have to have the last days occur. So, for example, if you are living during the latter times of the dispensation of grace, the rapture is not imminent because you still have to make it to the last days. So now go back with me to 1 Timothy 4, and here's what I want to touch on briefly. So how do you know whether you are in the latter times of the dispensation of grace? Well, verse 1 says this, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So during the latter times people will depart from the faith. Verse 2, Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now notice verse 3, Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So verse 1 talks about doctrines of devils, and verse 3 gives two examples of doctrines of devils. One of them is forbidding to marry. Another is commanding 
to abstain from meats. Now, a traditional interpretation of that passage is to say, well, that's a reference to Roman Catholicism. And it's a reference to Roman Catholicism because priests are not allowed to marry, and there is a command to abstain from meats during Lent. And so that's one way that people view that. The problem with that is those commands have existed for a very, very, very long time. Are those unique to the latter to the latter times? They really aren't. They've been around for a long time. So I don't personally believe that that's what 1 Timothy 4 is talking about. So I'm going to show you what I think is likely that 1 Timothy 4 is talking about. So I'm going to show some things on the screen here. I want you to look at this with me. So let's, yeah, so let's do Windows P here and duplicate. Thank you. So while this is refreshing, I'm going to show you something here. This is from the World Economic Forum. And so this is not an invented conspiracy theory. This is not something that you can say is not real. This is on, if you notice this, this is on the wefforum.org website. It's their website. Now notice what it says. Five reasons why eating insects could reduce climate change. And the idea is, of course, that greenhouse gases, climate change is destroying the earth. And so what should you do to prevent that? Well, you should eat bugs. If you were an enlightened person who really cared, you would stop eating meat and you would instead just use bugs as your protein. Now, maybe this is it, maybe it isn't, but doesn't that fit rather nicely with commanding to abstain from meats? Are some people going to use this and this becomes not just a suggestion, but a requirement. You should abstain from meats to save the earth. Now, you can decide for yourself, but let me tell you this. Th this earth isn't going to be destroyed until God destroys it, which he will in 2 Peter. And when God decides to destroy it, it won't be here no matter how much you recycle. And no matter what you try to do, you couldn't destroy this earth if you wanted to. God's going to destroy this earth in his timing, which is after we will all be gone. So I'm not saying definitively this is, but doesn't this feel like that could be the fulfillment of commanding to abstain from meats? That in the latter times, the worship of the earth comes to the point where what needs to happen is you are not allowed to eat animal products because we need to save the earth. Well, okay, so let's consider for the moment that that is what commanding to abstain from meats refers to. What haven't we addressed? Permitting to marry. So I'm going to go to a different website here, and it's the Babylon Bee. And so what is the Babylon Bee? The Babylon Bee is a satire site. In other words, it's not real. They have stuff on here that is made up. It's not real. Now, someone is going to see me referring to the Babylon Bee, and they're going to think, they're going to claim, well, David Reed thinks the Babylon Bee is real, and he's citing it as a source, and I'm sure this will be misconstrued because things are and such is life. But just to be clear for the record, the Babylon Bee is a satire site. It has false information. It is a humor site. It is not real. Okay, so as clear as can be, it's not real. Nonetheless, the Babylon Bee was banned from Twitter for being fake news, even though it is a satire site. That whole thing was absurd. But what I want to show you is this. Even though the Babylon Bee is a satire site, we live in times that are so absurd that they write articles that are fake and then they b become fulfilled. 
In other words, I don't know if you've noticed this, but the time period we're living in is nuts. It's crazy. There's just ridiculous things going on. <clears throat> so this page we're looking at here is the book of prophecy. And so what it has is it has, they call them prophecies, fake stories that they ran, and then months or years later, something happens in the real world that looks a lot like their story. So there's multiple pages here, but I'm just going to, for the sake of time, go to prophecy number eight. So if you see where it says, we said, they said, they ran an article that was fake. It was fake. And it's titled, Inclusivity Win, State of California to Make All Prisons Gender Neutral. And when they ran that in 2017, they were suggesting this is ridiculous. It is a dumb idea. It is an absurd idea. And I won't get into the details. You can probably figure them out. But is it a good idea to make all prisons uh, gender neutral and to house different inmates together? There's reasons why you wouldn't want to do that, okay? They ran that in 2017. Then in 2020, the actual headline is, California Governor Newsom signs law requiring transgender prison inmates to be housed based on gender identity. So that really happened. 2017, it's satire. It's fake. It's not real. 2020, what happens? Something that's very similar to that. Now, I'm not saying the Babylon Bee is prophetic. I'm not saying that. I'm mostly sharing this because it's curious. So what did the Babylon Bee run today, this very day? You ready? California becomes first state to ban heterosexual marriage. Now that's not, let's, let's be clear, that is a fake article. This is intended to be humorous. This is not real. The reason I'm sharing it with you is what history has shown us recently is people write satire that is absurd. It is ridiculous. It doesn't make sense. But we are living in such a goofy time that allow a little time to pass. And what was satire is now actual headline. So when 1 Timothy 4, 3 says forbidding to marry. If you just take that in its most literal, normal sense, what does it prophesy? That at some point, the powers that be will forbid to marry. And so I thought it was just curious and, 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 and you know, really interesting that the Babylon Bee ran this as a fake article, as satire, and we, of course, will see over time whether or not this article becomes true. Certainly, 1 Timothy 4.3 will be fulfilled in one form or another. It's going to happen. So just wanted to share that with you. We'll go back now to the next question. <clears throat> next question is this. Why is it important to fellowship with other believers? Or put differently... Why is it important to attend church? Well, some think there is no reason to attend church. And their reasoning is, well, I can listen online. And if I listen online, well, then I don't have to get up as early. And I can save gas and I can save time. And if I listen online, what I can do is I can wait. And then I'll listen to it at 1.5 speed. And so I can just, you know, how efficient, right? I save time and energy and so on. So I can get all the same content without being there. Well, if your church life is just receiving information, then that makes sense because it's efficient. It, it saves time and so on. But obviously, or hopefully this is obvious, your Christian life is more than just that. So I'm going to give you three reasons why you should attend church and fellowship with other believers. Go to Romans 12, verse 10. And the first reason is this. 
You have a ministry to other members of the body of Christ. If you are in the body of Christ, you have a ministry to other members of the body of Christ. So part of the reason that you go to church is to minister to other people. If you don't go, then obviously you can't minister to them. If you don't go, then you're not aware of who needs encouragement or what's going on in people's lives. You're, le you're less able to minister to other people. Look with me at Romans 12, verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. Romans 12, verse 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Get Romans 15, verse 1. What we're going to do is we're going to look at several verses here, and in looking at these verses, consider the question, is it more effective for me to fulfill these verses being home and by myself or being together with the body of believers? Romans 15, verse 1, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Obviously, it's easier to fulfill that verse if you're present with other believers. Verse 2, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. Get Galatians 5.13. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13. Galatians 5.13, for brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Galatians 6, verse 1. Galatians 6, 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Galatians 6, verse 10. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, Notice, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Well, if you have a responsibility to do good, especially unto those who are the household of faith, where should you go to find those people? And the obvious answer is you need to go to church. You need to fellowship with other believers if you're going to minister to them. Colossians 3, verse 16. Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Well, the function of music, one of the functions is to teach and admonish one another. That means people have to be present with you when you sing. When you sing by yourself in the shower, you're not really teaching and admonishing one another. Get 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Yet 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Now, we read a bunch of verses there, and here's simply the point. If you set out to fulfill those verses that talk about serving one another and caring for one another, wouldn't you naturally go to be with the people that you are to care for? That's, that's completely obvious. The, 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 the reality, just to, be, to call it for what it is, is, is we generally analyze things. The way we do is that we think about things as, well, what's in it for me? What do I get out of this? Well, as a member of the body of Christ, you're commanded to serve one another. And it's less about what is good for me, and it's more about what is my responsibility according to the Scriptures. Get with me Proverbs 27, verse 17. <clears throat> so the first reason to go to church is you have an obligation, you have a ministry to other members of the body of Christ. The second reason to go to church, to fellowship with other believers, is that 
Fellowship with other believers makes you stronger. Proverbs 27, verse 17. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. And you understand how that works, that iron sharpens iron, and, and, and we make each other better. A man sharpens the countenance of his friend. So reason number one is you go to church, you fellowship with other believers to minister to others. The second reason is they minister to you because iron sharpens iron. And the third reason is that you go to church to be a fellow laborer. And so I'm going to, we're going to look at Blue Letter Bible here. And I'm going to uh, run the word fellow. And it's going to pull up all the times that fellow appears. And I'm going to, in the options, <clears throat> I'm going to set the range to the Pauline epistles. <clears throat> so what I've done here is I've looked through the Pauline epistles and we've pulled up every time that fellow occurs in its various forms. And so I'm going to just flip through these quickly. You'll see the words highlighted in red. And just notice these compound words, if you will. You ready? Fellow prisoners, fellow helper, fellow citizens, fellow heirs, fellow soldier, fellow laborers, fellow servant, fellow servant, fellow prisoner, fellow workers, fellow laborer, fellow laborer, fellow soldier, fellow prisoner, fellow laborers. <clears throat> now, when you go through all those, <clears throat> What is the core theme? Well, you saw fellow laborer multiple times. You saw fellow worker. You saw fellow soldier. And the idea there <coughs> is that you are working together in a common cause. Get with me Ecclesiastes 4 verse 9. <clears throat> Get Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. The idea of Ecclesiastes 4 is that <clears throat> When you work together with someone else, you can accomplish more than working by yourself. And you, if you've ever worked with other folks, you understand that's the case. Sometimes they frustrate you, that happens. But you can accomplish more working together than working apart. Well, think about what you're trying to do in the body of Christ. <clears throat> if you're in the body of Christ today, your eternal destiny is, is fixed, it's resolved. You're saved, you can't lose your salvation. Thus, the fundamental responsibility that you have, the fundamental objective that you're trying to accomplish, obviously is to glorify God in all things, but on a, in an in a, in a <coughs> earthly sense, <coughs> what you're trying to do is to win others to Christ. That's the goal. <coughs> and so you can accomplish that better fellow laboring with other members of the body of Christ. Now, to be clear, I know that there are stranded grace believers that don't have a church, and so in that case, they need to do things like start a church, right? That's, that's the appropriate response. But what I, in answering this question, what I wanted to do is encourage grace believers who have a grace church to be consistent and intentional in being part of the church, in attending the church, in laboring with other believers, and in ministering and serving other members of of the body of Christ. So those are the three reasons we came across as to why you should attend church and why you should fellowship with other believers. Next question concerns Proverbs 16, verse 3. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 3. <clears throat> the question is, you often cite Bible verses outside of the Pauline epistles, 
and mention that the particular verse is a trans-dispensational truth. Do you have any thoughts whether Proverbs 16.3 and Proverbs 16.9 apply to the body of Christ? So are, is Proverbs 16.3, Proverbs 16.9, are those verses that have trans-dispensational application to the body of Christ? So let's start by reading Proverbs 16, verse 3. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. And the idea here is that the way to get your thought life established is to commit your works unto the Lord. Now, when you think about committing your works unto the Lord, that is obviously good transdispensational advice. No matter where you are in time, you should commit your works unto the Lord. <clears throat> this is a phrase that you're probably familiar with. Idle hands are what? <clears throat> yeah, I always heard it as the devil's playthings. And so the nature of idle hands, what does mankind, what does humanity instinctively do? So in other words, if you give people idle time, are they more likely to accomplish societal good or are they more likely to cause mischief or worse? And the reality is they're more likely to cause mischief or worse. One of the things you may recall, uh, during COVID, they did all kinds of things like stop Little League games and so there were children that were home for the summer that didn't have anything to do, and they found very young teens stealing cars. Why were they stealing cars when they weren't doing that the year before? Because society shut down and all the normal activities of life ceased. And so what happens then? Idle hands are the devil's playthings. Get with me 1 Corinthians 16, verse 15. So we understand idle hands are the devil's playthings, and we need to be busy about the work of the Lord. Let's look at a couple Pauline verses that will give us some additional clarity. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 16, verse 15. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Well, that addiction is a good thing, isn't it? Most of the times today when you talk about addiction, you know, you know what people are talking about. They're talking about dependency on chemicals of one form or another. But it's actually possible to be addicted to the ministry of the saints, and that would be a much more healthy addiction. If you think about the addict as someone that has desires and desires, and they keep coming back to the same thing and they can't get enough of it, well, if you addicted yourself to the ministry of the saints, how much time would you have to get into mischief? You wouldn't, right? Because your time would be, fulfill, would be full of good things. Look with me at 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, notice this, may abound to every good work. So if, if I were to ask you the question, how many good works should we be engaging in? Should we be having a moderate level of good works, a you know, medium level of good works, or a, a huge number of good works? And the answer is we should be abounding, right? We should be, we should be spending our time in good works. Now, if you think about that, if you're spending your time in good works, by definition, what does that mean for sin in your life? Well, the more time you're doing good, obviously, the less time you have for sin. So committing our, our works unto the Lord is obviously good advice during the dispensation of grace, and it, it does help with keeping us occupied in the right things. I now want to show you some other verses that Paul uh, mentions about how we need to think about our thoughts. So get Philippians 4, verse 8. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, 
if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. So the believer's responsibility, what the believer is commanded to do, is to think on the right things. Get with me 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, verse 5 is a tough verse, because what verse 5 says is, what do we need to do with every thought? We need to bring it into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, if I'm just being candid with you, do you ever have a thought where you think, hmm, that's, that's really not a great thought? And do you ever have a thought that's not a great thought, but you're like, oh, you know, I'm going to think about that a little bit more. And what happens is we allow ourselves to go down a path of continued evil thinking. The bad thought occurs, and what we fail to do is we fail to immediately dismiss it, and so we think on it for a while, and then what does that lead to? Leads to more thinking about that subject. Well, what 2 Corinthians 10 commands us is we need to take captive, we need to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Get Romans 12, verse 1. <clears throat> Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not to conform to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Here's the way that most religious fundamentalism works. Religious fundamentalism is focused on creating a visually pleasing product, meaning... Here's how you're supposed to dress. Here's how you're supposed to talk. Here are the things that you are allowed to do. Here are the things that you're not allowed to do. And it's designed to create a very rigid and humanly righteous, pleasing standard of performance. That's what it's designed to do. What that should remind you of, how did the Lord refer, refer to the Pharisees? He called them whited sepulchers. Outwardly beautiful, but what were they inwardly? They were full of dead men's bones, is what he said. My point is that what religion tends to do is it tends to create something that is externally pleasing, but inward completely lacking in substance. Now, when you look at Romans 12, verse 2, it says, Be ye transformed by a righteous external appearance. Be ye transformed on the outside. No, what does it say? Be ye transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. So the transformation is not external, it's inward. And that transformation is one that is real. Let me put it this way. Have you ever heard of a scandal where there's a church organization or official that is outwardly righteous by appearance, and then it turns out, well, actually, that's not what was going on? Why is that? Because it was outward and not inward. The inward transformation is the one that is real. Look at me at Colossians 3, verse 10. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 10. 
and have put on the new man, now notice this, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now, according to Colossians 3.10, the new man is renewed in knowledge. Is that knowledge reading the encyclopedia? Is that knowledge in worldly science? The knowledge obviously there is knowledge of the Word of God. So think about this with me. If in Romans chapter 12, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So to be transformed, you have to have your mind renewed. Well, what is your mind renewed by, according to Colossians 3? Knowledge. Therefore, the way that your life is transformed is by the Word of God. What will happen is people will sometimes say, well, your church life, right division, dispensationalism, it's all academic. It's intellectual. It's head-based, but not heart-based. And there's all sorts of things people say about dispensationalism. It's, it's studious, but it, it doesn't really, it's not life-changing. Well, if you believe what the Word of God says about how your life works, and, and to state the obvious, the Bible is the owner's manual written by the Creator. In other words, who is it that knows how humanity works? It's God. And the Bible is His instructions for us on how life is to work. So if we don't follow these, then we're going to, by definition, just walk in confusion because this is what tells us the truth. Get with me Colossians 1 verse 10. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. Now notice this, and increasing in the knowledge of God. So the thing we need to do to be transformed, to have our mind renewed, is we have to increase in the knowledge of God. And the only way to do that is through the study of His Word. So the Word needs to be a central part of our lives. So back to the question of Proverbs 16.3. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Well, it's obviously a good idea to commit thy works unto the Lord. 1 Corinthians 16 talks about being addicted to the ministry of the saints, so we should be so busy with good works that we don't have time for evil works. That, that's all true. But what we also need to do is, based upon Philippians 4, 8, we need to think on the right things. Based upon 2 Corinthians 10, we need to take cap, we need to bring every thought into the captivity of Christ. And what we need to do is the inner man needs to be increasing in the knowledge of God, and that comes from his word. So the word is significant. I'll say one more thing on that. <clears throat> what would you do in the following situation? You have a loved one and they're not physically present with you. They're far away. And you can't communicate with them by email and you can't communicate with them by phone. And the only way that you can communicate with them is that they send you epistles. And you can send them back epistles. And that's it. If that's the only way you could communicate, then what would you naturally do? Well, you would pay attention to those epistles. And you would read them more than once. And you would read them carefully to get every morsel of information of truth that is in them. Well, can I tell you that's the situation we're in? Now, your wind dwelt by the Holy Spirit. It's not that God is far from us, but how does God communicate with you? Does He communicate with you through circumstances? Does He communicate with you when you wake up in the morning and He says, good morning, Jim. So glad to see you up. That doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. God communicates with us through this book, and therefore, if we are to know his thoughts, what must we be in? This book, there's no other option. So give me Proverbs 16, verse 9. Proverbs 16, verse 9. This was the second question.
Proverbs 16, verse 9 says this, A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. So what the questioner is asking, does God direct our steps today? So first of all, get Ecclesiastes 9, verse 11. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 11. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill. Now notice this. But time and chance happeneth to them all. Ecclesiastes is in the Old Testament, obviously. Under the Old Testament, even when God is dealing with Israel as his chosen nation, were there things that happened in life that were chance? And the answer clearly is yes. Are there things that happen today in life that are chance? And the answer to that is yes. What, what people often adopt is they often adopt some Calvinistic fatalism about life. Where, in other words, why did this natural disaster happen? Why was I in this car accident? Because think about, think about this for a car accident just for a minute. There are saved people that are driving on their way, and a drunk driver hits them and severely injures them, maybe kills them, maybe he paralyzes them. That same moment that that believer was paralyzed by a drunk driver, there was a different believer driving somewhere else that wasn't hit by a drunk driver. Which was, did, did God foreordain that? Did God plan that this, per, this believer was to be hit by a drunk driver and this believer was not? Well, the answer you, you have to understand is there is a lot in life that is nothing other than chance. And you know that from Ecclesiastes 9, verse 11. Time and chance happeneth to all. Get with me 2 Corinthians 2, verse 12. So we understand that a lot of life is just chance. However, let's understand some other things also. Some have the idea that during the dispensation of grace, God doesn't interact with the earth in any capacity, that he just sort of lets things happen as they do. Well, look at me at 2 Corinthians 2, verse 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me, what are the next three words? Of the Lord. So who opened the door? Well, that wasn't chance. God opened that door. Look at me at Colossians 4, verse 3. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 3. With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. In Colossians 4, Paul's praying that God would open a door of utterance. So you've seen multiple different verses here where does God have the ability to open doors for the proclamation of the truth? He does. Look at me at Philippians 2, verse 25. Philippians 2, verse 25. Well, what about physical circumstances? Does God ever affect physical circumstances during the dispensation of grace? Philippians chapter 2, Philippians 2, 25. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death. So how sick was he? Pretty sick. Now read this. But God had mercy on him and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. 
Now, in that passage, God's mercy upon Aphrodite included what? Physical healing. Philippians is written after Acts 28, I believe. So can God physically heal people today? The answer to that is yes. There's no reason that he can't. Now, let's be clear on something. Does that mean I can claim my healing? Have you seen the prayers where what people do is they claim things? And they say, you know, here's what I'm claiming, and now, God, you have to do this because I've claimed it. Is that the way that it works? Well, that, that's, that's simply not the way that it works. We don't get to boss God around and say, God, listen, you're, you're, I know you're trying hard, but you're just not running the universe perfectly, but thankfully I'm here to give you some advice. And so here's the seven things you need to do, and then the universe will be great. That, that is just complete and utter madness. We can pray about things, we can request things, but we can't demand things, and we can't claim things, and we can't, you know, mandate that God heals us and things like that. Look at Philemon, verse 22. Philemon, verse 22. Philemon, verse 22. But with all, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. Now, notice with me in verse uh, 10. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten, in my bonds. Paul's talking here about being bound. In other words, he's in prison. Verse 22, but with all prepare me also lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. He's talking there about a, a physical deliverance, right? When he says prepare me a lodging, he's saying, you know, prepare a place for me to stay, a physical place for me to be, because I trust that through your prayers I shall be given you. He's talking about being released from jail. And again, Philemon is post Acts 28. Can God deliver people from jail? Yes, he can. Does that mean that he will in every circumstance? No, it doesn't. Get with me Daniel 3, verse 17. Daniel 3, verse 17. Daniel 3, 17. Now this is with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Verse 17. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. So Nebuchadnezzar, he, in this context, he, he threatens Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He says, I want you to bow down and worship the image I've created. And they say, nope, we're not going to do that. He says, well, if you don't do that, I'm throwing you into the fiery furnace. And their response to that is to say, well, listen, God can deliver us from you, king. And I know, king, you think you're in charge, but, you know, just to be candid with you, the only authority you have is the authority God gives you. You could die the next second. So they say there, and he will deliver us. So they expect to be delivered. Now read verse 18. But if not, oh, if we're not delivered which could happen, by the way, were there Old Ta Testament prophets that were put to death? The harder question is, were there Old Testament prophets that weren't put to death, <laughs> right? There are lots of Old Testament prophets put to death because God did not deliver them. And of course, what happened to Paul at the end of his life? He was executed by Rome. Verse 18, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Well, you can see very clearly under the prophetic program in the Old Testament that God could deliver believers from circumstances, but there obviously wasn't a guarantee, as witnessed by the fact that numerous Old Testament prophets were put to death. So, how do we think about Proverbs 16, verse 9 today. Does the Lord direct our steps? Or put another way, does he influence the events of our lives? Well, man has free will. 
and man makes his own choices for which he is accountable. God can exercise influence. Can God open doors today? Yes, he can. Can God heal people today? Yes, he can. There's nothing that says that he cannot. But is this something that we can claim? And the answer to that is plainly no, that we cannot. Now, let me ask you this. An event happens. Can we tell if God did it or not? See, here's what happens so much. An event happens, and we like it. God did that. So an event happens, and I get a big raise, or I win the lottery. Although I'll tell you, if you don't buy lottery tickets, it's very hard to win the lottery. And that's what I would suggest to you. But so an event happens, and if we like it, what is the natural reaction? Well, that's God. And if we don't like it, then what do we say? Satan did it. And that is just the most simplistic, ridiculous analysis that there is. Are there sometimes wonderful blessings that come out of difficult circumstances? Yes, there are. Get with me Philemon verse 15. Philemon and verse 15. Now, in, in the book of Philemon, you understand that the background is that Paul bumped into Onesimus, and Onesimus got saved as a result of Paul's ministry. And Onesimus was running away from his master Philemon. So notice what Paul says in, in verse 15. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. Now, when you think about those circumstances, if you were Paul, wouldn't you be tempted to say, well, I see God's hand in this because Onesimus ran away from Philemon, and as he ran away, he bumped into the apostle, the Gentiles, and got saved. That seems like something the Holy Spirit would do, doesn't it? I mean, God desires people to be saved, but Paul doesn't say that. The word he uses is perhaps. So can you look at the events of life and say, God did this, or Satan did this, or it was chance? And the answer is, you don't know. You don't have the ability to fix a label to those things because God hasn't given us the information we need to do that. So back to the question, does the Lord direct our steps today? God can influence the events of our lives, but we don't know what happens because God desires it to happen and what happens because it's just chance. And of course, most of what happens happens because of our decisions, right? What is the single greatest source of problems in your life? And the answer is always, always, always us. We are the greatest source of our own problems. We are close to eight, so I'm going to stop there, and we will pick up here next time. Uh, I'll, I'll close with this. We have, we've had some AV problems recently. Uh, we have a really good web mistress, webmaster, and she has solved them, I think. So appreciate your patience, and uh, thank you for being with us. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this time we could meet together. We thank you for the truth of your word. We pray, Lord, that we would be busy being in the word and that we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.